Think Forward. Think Research Channel. Hughes Medical Institute. The 2001 Holiday Lectures on Science. This year's lectures, The Meaning of Sex, Genes and Gender, will be given by Dr. Barbara Meyer, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the University of California, Berkeley, and Dr. David Page, Howard Hughes Medical Institute investigator at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. The first lecture is titled, Deciphering the Language of Sex. And now to introduce our program, the president of the Howard Hughes Medical Institute, Dr. Thomas Check. Welcome to the Howard Hughes Medical Institute and to the 2001 Holiday Lectures on Science, the ninth in our series. Our auditorium here is filled with bright-eyed high school students from throughout the greater Washington, D.C. area. Welcome, students, and also welcome to those of you who are joining us uh, by our live webcast through the Internet. Special welcome to the educators and students in Moscow, Russia, who are joining us by a video link. To you, I can't say good morning. I have to say good evening. Yaradvui snami. Each of you started out as a single cell, the product of a fertilization event of a sperm and an egg. And for about the first seven weeks of life, you were all generic embryos. But then, in the seventh week, something started to happen that would result in about half of you becoming boy embryos and half of you becoming girl embryos. That's going to be the topic of our lectures this year. Now, all of you know that this has something to do with the X and Y chromosome, that men have an X and a Y, women have two X chromosomes. But what is it about these chromosomes, or about the genes that are located on these chromosomes, that lead to the development of one sex or the other? And that's going to be our topic. The genes, the molecules, and the molecular processes that are involved in sex determination. You'll hear about this over the next two days. Howard Hughes Medical Institute hosts these holiday lectures in part as a way of highlighting the world-famous scientists who work in our laboratories. These investigators, over 300 in number, and their research groups are located at more than 70 host institutions, including MIT in Cambridge, where David Page comes from, and UC Berkeley in California, which is the uh, laboratory home of Barbara Meyer and her group. You can learn more about our investigators by logging on to our website. Now, in addition to our biomedical researchers, we also, as part of our mission, support science education at all kinds of levels, from public outreach through our museums program, through uh, K through 12 education and teacher education. We support undergraduate research experiences for college students. Uh, we support graduate fellowships and medical education. And one of the great things about the holiday lectures is it really brings together these two sort of arms of Howard Hughes Medical Institute, the investigators program and the researchers and the science education. So this is one of the reasons we're particularly excited about this annual event. You're going to hear four lectures. The first is going to present and be presented by David Page, who's a Hughes investigator uh, at MIT. Uh, he's also a professor of biology there and a member of the Whitehead Institute. And David is a, I've known David for a long time. He's a, a very skilled uh, researcher, but also presents very well. So I think you'll really enjoy his lecture, the first of which is going to be entitled Deciphering the Language of Sex. David will speak for about 40 minutes, and he'll have questions 
uh, halfway through, and then again at the end. So as he's talking, you might want to think about what questions you would like to ask. Then we'll have a half hour break uh, and hear from Barbara Meyer. David, I know you've always wanted to be on MTV. Well, we didn't, we weren't able to arrange that. But next best thing, we have a video uh, about you and uh, your uh, research interests, which we're going to show now. And after the video, uh, the stage is yours. 1957, year of space and Sputnik dogs. Like How did I get interested in science? The mid-1950s, uh, when I was born, was the time of Sputnik. So the Soviets sent that satellite around the Earth. And 600 miles, the half-ton satellite joined the meteors in outer space to orbit around and the Earth. And the adults of my parents' generation decided that kids needed to learn science if the United States was to be strong. I started some research while I was in medical school, and I couldn't bring myself to giving, to giving it up. In fact, I'm, I am today continuing the research that I began while I was a medical student. I was lucky enough to enter the Human Genome Project absolutely, I wouldn't even call it the ground floor, it was below ground level. I started on this project to make a genetic map of the human genome, and I quickly found myself with some DNA markers for the human X and Y chromosomes, purely by accident. By picking these DNA probes for the X and the Y chromosomes, that got me interested in sex chromosomes and in how male and female appear during embryogenesis. Jeremy. Hey. hey. How's it going? In our lab, we're looking for several things. We want to understand what sex chromosomes are and how to think about them. That's one thing. A second thing that we want to understand is what do genes have to do with infertility in humans? Right now, our work is, fo is focused particularly on on male infertility. Is it environment? Is it genes? We don't fully know, but we're, we're clearly finding that a good bit of it is due to genes. My goals for the holiday lectures are two things. There's some biology that I want to explain. Uh, some biology that I'm very excited about. What it means to be male, what it means to be female. When I was in high school, I had never met a scientist and so science for me was, was very abstract. So the second goal for me in my being and my presenting to, to be a scientist that, um, and to show what a scientist is, I want to provide a glimpse of what it is to be a scientist, a glimpse of what it is to think like a scientist and why it's an exciting career option. Good morning. Um, I want to begin with a few questions, some pretty easy ones, I think. So feel free to shout out some answers. I really want you to shout out a couple answers. Um, in what year were you born? I, see, I hear a lot of 86s and some 85s, something like that. Uh, 83, 84, 84, OK, 84 is trying to win right now. Um, <laughs> In any case, somewhere there, 83, 84, 85, it definitely makes me feel a little old. Um, okay, at the moment of your birth, once it was established that you were healthy enough to cry, uh, what was the next question on your parents' mind, on everybody else's mind? Boy or girl, you got it. So how did your parents and your doctors or whoever else was in the delivery room, how did they figure out whether you were a boy or a girl. Are you have any any guesses? Um, well, uh, there's a lot of laughing here. Um, so they they took a look and they saw whether your external genitalia were those of a male or a female. And so, having determined that you were a girl or a boy on this basis, your parents could finally decide what name to give you, and they could announce your existence to the world. Well, maybe, maybe the card announcing your birth didn't look exactly uh, like these. Uh, uh, ho hopefully we won't be arrested for showing those photographs. Uh, <laughs> but that leads us to a very big question, which is, how is a human embryo's sex determined? 
what determines whether a baby is born a girl or a boy? So first, we have to think about a partial list of the anatomic uh, differences to be accounted for. So we're going to start where we began with the external genitalia. We got the penis and the scrotum in the male, clitoris and labia in the female. And looking within the body, uh, the gonads, testes in males, ovaries in females, the internal accessory structures, epididymis, vas deferens, I could mention the seminal vesicles in the male, and in the female, the fallopian tubes in the uterus. Uh, and finally, the gametes, the sperm and the egg. Now, throughout the animal kingdom, the sex that produces the little gametes, or the sperm, uh, that sex is called the male. If you make the little gametes, you're the male. If you make the big gametes, or the eggs, you're the female. And so in a broad biological sense, this is the most fundamental definition of male or female. Big gamete or little gamete. Now, of course, the big gamete is full of nutrients. And the little gamete is, uh, you know, to be honest, the little gamete is nothing more than a tiny packet of DNA in the head with a propulsion system. Uh, maybe we're connecting back to Sputnik there in some way. Uh, now, how many chromosomes how many chromosomes do these gametes have? 23? That was pretty quick. That's a, good, that's a good sign. OK. And so we take, at the moment of fertilization, we add 23 and 23 and, uh, together and reestablish the diploid number of 46. This is great. We got a chorus here. Uh, OK. So now while it's obvious that the member of, members of our species come in these two fundamental forms, uh, that is not at all obvious in early embryos, as Tom Cech just mentioned. So we are born 40 weeks after fertilization, and during the first six weeks after fertilization, the reproductive structures begin to take shape, but there is no sexu sexual differentiation apparent by any measure. So at six weeks, human embryos that are destined to become males are anatomically indistinguishable from embryos that are destined to become females. It's only about uh, seven weeks after fertilization, it's only about seven weeks after fertilization that the structure called the gonad, or the, actually the bipotential gonad, uh, begins to take on the distinctive characteristics of either the testis in the male or the ovary in the female. So that gon the gonad is the first part of the body to take a sexual move. And then hormonal secretions of the gonads, either the testes or the ovaries, they secrete hormones that determine the uh, sexual fate of all the other reproductive structures, including, as shown here, the internal accessory structures, the external genitalia, and so on. And these sex hormones are, uh, are responsible for masculinizing or feminizing a lot of the body, including the brain. But what we're going to focus on today is how the bipotential gonad decides to become a testis or ovary, because that's the pivotal and first decision in becoming a male or female. Well, let's think about some history. It's been obvious that the members of our species come in two fundamental forms. That's been obvious for a long time, so people have been thinking about this for a long, long time. But it was not obvious that sex was determined by genes, at least not until the 20th century. Because Mendel's gene concept, remember Mendel was working in that pea garden in the 1860s, but nobody paid much attention to those ideas until the opening years of the 20th century. Uh, and so, but before Mendel's ideas were widely appreciated, people were thinking about heredity, but the prevailing idea was blending. Those who were thinking about heredity were focused upon an idea of blending. The idea was that you took some of mom's characteristics and you took some of dad's characteristics and you threw them in the hereditary blender and out came the child's characteristics. Well, let's think about blending and sex. Blending didn't seem to provide much of an explanation for this binary decision that sex determination represents, right? In, with regard to sex, you either look like your mother or your father. You don't look like a blended version of the two. And so, uh, if heredity was blending, then sex must not be a matter of heredity. And so the focus was on environment. And in the 1890s, 
you know, 10 years before Mendel's ideas would be rediscovered. In the 1890s, the prevailing model of how human sex was determined uh, was that the mother's diet during pregnancy was the critical issue. Now, I've never been able to figure out how this theory accounted for boy-girl twins. Uh, and then there were other theories that focused on things like the phase of the moon or the state of the economy or war or peace things like that. And if you're looking for new theories of sex determination, you can find them practically any week in the, uh, uh, in the scientific journals at your local supermarket. <laughs> uh, now, much earlier, uh, Aristotle had his own theory of sex determination. He claimed that the sex of a human embryo was determined by the father's temperature and level of excitement uh, during intercourse. So according to Aristotle, the higher the heat, the greater the chance that one would have a, a boy, you say. I didn't complete the sentence. You did. Um, ideas, yes, he did say it was, it was uh, likely to be a boy. So ideas about how sex is determined began to change in the first years of the 20th century. So using the light microscope and uh, pouring at these blob-like structures in the nucleus called chromosomes. And I should say that in the early years of the 20th century, you could see these colorful bodies, chromosomes, colorful blobs in the nucleus, but they weren't in any way linked to heredity as yet. But some cell biologists became convinced that there was a systematic difference between the set of blobs that you saw in the nuclei of male and female beetles, and also between the male and the female of certain species of flies, including the fruit fly Drosophila melanogaster. So uh, what these cell biologists, these blob watchers, noted uh, in the opening years of the 20th century was that in fruit flies, both males and females had three matched pairs of blobs. They shared three matched pairs of blobs, which we now recognized to be three pairs of autosomes. But in addition, the males had an unmatched pair. And not knowing what else to call them, this unmatched pair got called the X and the Y. And then it was recognized the females had a fourth matched pair called the two Xs. So now I got a really tough question for you. Uh, given just this data, the data shown on this slide, females are XX, males are XY. Do you want to propose, I'd like you to propose some models of how sex might be determined. And I'm actually looking for two competing models. Anybody want to suggest a model? How might sex be determined in flies? Any suggestions? Yes? Um, by forming an uh, um, amniocentesis, or? Well, no, I'm just, what I'm, what I'm asking is, uh, given that females have two X chromosomes and males have an X and a Y, what might the sex determining signal in the fly be? Yes? Uh, the number of X chromosomes. Okay, so sex could be determined by the number of X chromosomes, females having two, males having one. Okay? Uh, your, uh, another, que another possibility, yes? The presence of a Y. Okay, it could be the presence or absence of the Y chromosome. So we have two competing hypotheses now. Sex could be determined by the presence or absence of the Y, or it could be determined by the number of X chromosomes. So settling these questions, choosing between these two, was an important matter. And the answer came in 1916, and it heralded the birth of genetics as a new field in biology. And in the spring of 1916, scientists published uh, the first issue of, an, of a new magazine. It was new in 1916. And this is that first issue. The journal is called Genetics. And in an article that begins, and you can look at it afterwards, in an article that begins on page one of volume one of Genetics, uh, you will read that females, uh, that, that fruit flies with two X's plus a Y develop as females, while uh, while those with one X and no Y chromosome develop as males. So what are you going to conclude? It looks like sex is actually determined in flies 
by the number of X chromosomes. And this was the first time that any organismal trait or phenotype in any species was connected to a specific chromosome. And that's why it was page one of volume one of genetics. And in lecture two, Barbara Myers is going to discuss that in uh, the nematode C. elegans, a very similar counting of the X chromosomes occurs and plays a critical role in determining whether the embryo develops, in that case, as a female or a hermaphrodite. But that's more for lecture two. Well, in 1923, sex chromosomes were, di were discovered in our species. And as in fruit flies, a nicely matched pair of Xs in females and a mismatched pair XY in males. So what would you have thought in 1923, only seven years after the first issue of genetics announced that it was the number of X chromosomes in flies? Well, in 1923, it was quite reasonably assumed that uh, if sex in fruit flies was determined by the number of X chromosomes, then the same should be true in humans. Well, these extrapolations often proved to be valid in biology, but this one didn't hold up. But it wasn't until 36 years later, in 1959, that the role of the human sex chromosomes was clarified. Human geneticists reported that uh, some females have a single X chromosome and that some males have two X chromosomes plus a Y. The conclusion coming out of these studies was that in, in humans, the sex determining signal is the presence or absence of the Y chromosome, independent of, uh, the, number of, uh, independent of the number of Xs. Okay. The same was uh, demonstrated in mice, another mammal to which we'll return in a, in a couple of minutes. So in human embryos, then, how does the presence or absence of the Y determine the fate of the bipotential gonad? Well, geneticists love to discover and study exceptions, and there are apparent exceptions to the rule that the Y is uh, sex determining, and these are cases called XX males and XY females. Now, XX males have, have testes and male structures. Uh, despite the presence, as judged by light microscopy, of two X chromosomes. XY females have ovaries and female structures despite the uh, presence of a Y chromosome. Now, it turns out that XX males occur about 1 in 20,000 males, uh, XY females perhaps at a comparable frequency. Now, we and other scientists had suspected that XX males might carry a portion of the Y chromosome, a testis determining portion, that was not detectable by light microscopy. And using Y DNA probes, this proved to be the case. At the top of the uh, slide is a normal Y chromosome as found in a, in a uh, usual XY male. So we have the short arm of the Y, the centromere of the long arm. The XX males turn out to carry terminal portions of the short arm of the Y chromosome. And you see here that they form a nested series. Now that suggests that the testis determining gene or genes on the Y might be in this region that they carry. That was dramatically confirmed by findings in XY females. Some XY females are missing precisely the part of the Y chromosome that is present in the XX males. So that suggested that, this, that the region in common that is present in the XX males and absent in the XY females might contain the critical genes. <clears throat> the critical gene or genes. And it turns out that within that critical region, there is only one gene, and it's called SRY. It encodes a DNA binding protein that probably turns on or turns off other genes in the bipotential gonad. And let's look at the definitive experiment that proved that SRY is the sex determining gene in mammals. And this involves making something called a transgenic mouse. We're going to begin with fertilized mouse eggs. So we have an XX uh, fertilized egg flushed from the reproductive tract of a recently mated female. Now at this point, this egg is destined to become what? Female. OK, but what we're going to do is inject pure DNA. We're going to inject um, not just any DNA, but the mouse SRY gene, the mouse Y chromosomes counterpart to the human SRY gene. We're going to inject that gene, 
And it turns out that it will integrate into a mouse chromosome randomly, and therefore most likely into an autosome, generating a transgenic egg bearing the SRY transgene. Now place the transgenic egg in the uterus of a foster mother, where the egg will develop as an embryo for 20 days. Uh, uh, if that's how long it takes for uh, mouse development, and birth leading to birth, and the, and the birth of a transgenic mouse who's XX plus SRY. And lo and behold, this mouse has testes and is a male. Doesn't make sperm. The XX males don't make sperm. The XY females uh, also don't make sperm. And this led these researchers who produced it to proudly announce on the cover of Nature, again displaying the external genitalia, that it is a boy. And I'd like to stop at this point and see if you have any, any questions. Any questions? Yes, a question in the house. You mentioned Turner syndrome and Kleinfelter syndrome. Kleinfelter syndrome, yes. What, I, I don't know anything about the, like, what are the, what happens to people who have those? Right. So, so what are Turner syndrome? What are Kleinfelter syndrome? What are these syndromes? Well, so Turner syndrome, those are the girls and women who have one X chromosome and have no second sex chromosome. Those girls and women are, are quite short. Um, the ovaries actually degenerate to form so-called streaks. So those girls don't spontaneously go through puberty. And they will, uh, they will not be fertile. There are some other... Uh, some other parts of the body are sometimes affected. There can be some webbing of the neck, sometimes kidney anomalies and such. So there are effects throughout the body. But here I was making the point that Turner syndrome helps illustrate that it's not the number of X's, but it's the presence or absence of the Y that's sex determining. In Kleinfelder's syndrome, um, uh, those males who are XXY, the major problem is they don't produce sperm. Another question, yes? Uh if you all determine that SRY creates the testes in the male, do you know what causes them to produce sperm then? Ah, okay. So why is it that why is it these that these XX males, both the humans and the and the XX plus SRY mice, why don't they make sperm? Well, we're going to actually come back to that in some detail. I'm going to come back to that in some detail in lecture four, but it turns out that. Those individuals and those mice seem to have two strikes against them. It looks like having two X chromosomes is somehow incompatible with producing sperm. And it also looks like other genes on the Y chromosome are required for producing sperm. So there are two reasons. How about uh, another house question? Yes, over here. Um, SRY changes an XX um, embryo to male, right? That's right. And then. Um, what changes an XY embryo to a female? Ah, well, so in the XY female, we were missing, the XY female's Y chromosome was missing the SRY gene, okay? So the SRY wasn't present. We're actually going to come back in the second half of this lecture and re-examine that question of how does SRY come to be missing in an XY female? Great question. Yes? Is the SRY the, what determines whether they have testes or not? Is that what it does, basically? Yes, that's exactly. The question uh, concerned, is SRY the cause of the gonad, does it cause the gonad to develop as a testis? That is exactly uh, what we think is going on. That the bipotential gonad is set, is poised, to become either a testis or an ovary. And if SRY is present, it follows the testicular path. If SRY is not present, follows the ovarian path. Okay, let's take a question from Moscow. Uh, Moscow Lyceum. Yes. Anton, Moscow yes. uh, Chemical Lyceum. It is common knowledge that even if there is a set of genes X, X and Y is active at that time, you can observe the development of a male sex in the body. If there is no explanation, how do you explain for the activity of X or Y in a human body? I think the, the, the question concerned whether we can clearly um, see the activity of the Y chromosome in the human body. Um, much of what I told you about 
how we think SRY is acting comes from studies that are carried out not in human embryos, where the research is, is difficult, uh, but in mouse embryos. In other words, uh, we think that we can use the mouse, and we'll hear much more about the, uh, the use of other species as models for human development. We study the action of SRY in the developing mouse, and then try to convey and transfer that knowledge and insight from what's happening in the bipotential gonad of the mouse embryo to our understanding of what's happening in the bipotential gonad of the human embryo. Okay, we're going to turn to a last question from the house, if there are any more questions. Yes, in the back. Um, do women who have uh, XY chromosomes, do, they, do, those, uh, do their gonads produce testosterone or uh, estrogen? Do they have male hormones or female hormones? Oh, okay. So, uh, these XY females who are missing SRY, are they really female or do they have male levels of testosterone? Actually, tomorrow in lecture four, we're going to return to the question of, of uh, testosterone and estrogen. Um, but it turns out these XY females do not have male um, hormone levels. They have female hormone levels. So they are very much feminized. Again, the, the, uh, the only problem is the absence, the inability to produce uh, substantial numbers of oocytes, and, uh, uh, and these XY girls will not progress spontaneously through puberty. So they often actually have to have some hormone replacements uh, during adolescence and into adulthood. Okay, I want to thank you all. Great questions. So, so far in this lecture, I've, I've made a great deal out of a human embryo's uh, becoming male if SRY is present or becoming female if SRY is absent. And now I want to consider with you an even bigger question. I mean, that's a pretty important one. Are you a boy or are you a girl? But now I want to take on a much bigger question, which is why does nature bother with two sexes in the first place? And to put the question more bluntly, since only females can give birth, why should nature bother with males? Or are males really necessary? Now, wouldn't it be simpler, wouldn't it be more efficient for our species or any other species to consist exclusively of females, to reproduce without sex? Well, consider Dolly the cloned sheep. Right? Dolly helps us frame the contest between sexual reproduction, and I'm going to say sexual reproduction means having a mother and a father, uh, versus asexual cloning, which is having only a mother. Now, in the interest of full disclosure, I should acknowledge that I am a father, and so you might suspect that I'm biased, uh, but that's too bad because I'm giving the lecture. <laughs> so, uh, in Dolly's cells, in, in Dolly's nuclei, all the DNA came from one parent. So Dolly was generated by taking um, a sheep egg, an unfertilized sheep egg in that case, taking an unfertilized sheep egg, removing the nucleus, and replacing it with the nucleus of a breast cell from an adult sheep. Now, that female that donated the breast cell nucleus became the one and only genetic parent of Dolly. So today, by today, goats, cattle, pigs, and mice have all been cloned by similar procedures. Now, you may say, sure, but these were experiments that were conducted by scientists in laboratories, and they have nothing to do with the natural world. So I want you to consider with me Dolly's wild and natural counterpart, which is the Laredo striped whiptail. Uh, this is a lizard living in the Rio Grande Valley of Texas and Mexico. Now, this species is a girls only club, and the girls reproduce by cloning themselves. Now, there are some sister species, uh, other whiptail lizards, that reproduce sexually. And so I want to compare the two reproductive strategies. So we're going to compare life as a female whiptail with and without males. Now, <clears throat> in species with males over here, life is, is fairly routine. It's fairly dull. Uh, females produce eggs and males produce sperm. Fertilization occurs and... <laughs> Uh, and the male inclusive life cycle is completed. But in species without males, 
Life has a sort of a different texture. Uh, females produce eggs, but those eggs don't need sperm. Through parthenogenesis, which is a big word, which in this case means we don't understand anything about what's happening, uh, the unfertilized egg is capable of giving rise to another adult, which is always a female. So I got some questions for you here. On the left, in the sexual species, these gametes, the egg and the sperm, these gametes have how many copies of each gene? They are haploid, or 1N, right? Now, <clears throat> so what's the biological process that generates haploid cells? Meiosis, okay? So these are 1N cells generated through meiosis. Now, on the right, in the females only species, did these eggs go through meiosis? You're pretty sure about that? They didn't go through meiosis? Well, I agree. I don't think they went through meiosis because one of the things you do in meiosis is cut your number of genes in half. And it wouldn't take too many generations over here to run out of genes, right? If you went through meiosis every life cycle. So certainly we don't have the, any kind of meiosis that we're familiar with, at least, over here. So the question then of, are males really necessary? That is equivalent to the question to participate in meiosis or to abstain. To have sex or to clone, to have meiosis or no. So meiosis then, I'm going to argue, meiosis is the defining feature of sexual reproduction. Now, have you studied meiosis? <laughs> you covered meiosis, so you know you got leptatine and zygotine and pacotine and dancing chromatids and homologs, and you can barely keep track of all these things. Well, today I ask only that you keep track of two consequences of meiosis. So one is gene swapping. Gene swapping is this process you know about recombination, reciprocal exchanges between paired chromosomes, that's a big consequence of meiosis. A second big consequence of meiosis we've already mentioned briefly is that you divide the genes by, by half. You divide, them by, you divide them by two. So that each gamete receives one of each chromosome pair, uh, receives one of each of the, of the paired genes present in the parent. Now, so is this trio of males, sex, and meiosis really necessary? Well not in an abs absolute sense, as illustrated by the, the Laredo striped whiptail lizard, so why bother? So the question I put to you then, is sex good? In an evolutionary sense. <laughs> uh, what, is, what is the long-term value of meiosis, of sexual reproduction? Yes? Genetic diversity. Genetic diversity, okay. Um, we're going to come back to that idea. Yes? Recombination maintains the uh, chromosomal uh, stability of each gene. Maintains the stability of the genes. Let's get some more ideas out here. You don't think they're going to be able to breed too well. OK, yes. The asexual, you think, are not going to be able to breed too well. Another thought. The ability to adapt to a changing environment. Adapt to a changing environment. Okay, so I'm hearing that it sounds, you, you, you're all pretty convinced that it is a good thing to have sexual meiosis, to have sex, to have meiosis, have this recombination, this shuffling of genes because it's going to allow you to adapt to a changing environment, perhaps to put together nice new beneficial combinations of genes. Well. I want to come back to this question of are males really necessary and to look, I want to look more closely at the uh, relative advantages of asexual cloning. We're going to look, we're going to do a head-to-head -head contest between asexual cloning and sexual reproduction and uh, I'm going to need, you, you, perhaps you've been wondering what these fruits and vegetables are for up here on the, you've noticed these? Okay, um, so I need four volunteers. Um, I need four volunteers. Now, I need three females and one male. Uh, don't worry, this is not, 
I'm not running a dating service or anything. Um, okay, so I'm gonna got uh, one one woman up here and uh, one here and one back there, and I need okay, sir. Yes, why don't you join us? Okay, so if you'll come down front and take your positions behind the uh, behind the table here, we will put you in charge of your uh, of your genomes. Um, okay, so sir, why don't you stand here and going to have, yeah, why don't you come over here, and if you could be here and there. That looks great. Okay, now, uh, <clears throat> I'm going to explain that you, you didn't know it when you, when you took these positions, but uh, I see, actually, the asexual experiment is over here on the right. Now, remember, on the, on the cloning, on those, when we clone, when we reproduce by cloning, we have female-only species. All right, and we have over here the uh, we have over here the gene shufflers. This is the sexual recombination team. Okay, and we have each of these um, uh, each of these members of these two species, um, the sexual species here, the clonal species over there. Each of the members of these species has three different genes, two copies of each gene. Right. And it looks like, and I just want to, I want everyone to verify that this contest is starting uh, with a level playing field, right? Everybody has got, would you please confirm, would you agree that you all have the same set of genes to begin? Okay. Uh, you can inspect any of these fruits and vegetables um, if you feel, you know, that you might be shortchanged. I want everybody to start feeling good about their, their genes and their genomes. Um, okay. So, now... The trick is, I gotta, I gotta express some of the rules. So, first of all, each female can have one offspring per reproductive cycle. Males can have no offspring. I'm sorry about this, but <laughs> this is just the way it works. Now, the clonal reproducers, the clonal reproducers, you are gonna pass all of your genes to each of your offspring, okay? You are gonna pass all of your genes to all of your offspring. You got that? Okay, now over here on this side, you are, gonna, you are gonna pass one of each of your genes to your offspring, and you are gonna contribute. So the two of you are gonna have to create sort of a, a tray when we, have, when we carry this out. Okay, so let's go through the first cycle. So you two are just gonna have an offspring. You're gonna have one offspring, these genes, one with these. You, need to make, you two need to make choices and put uh, one of each of your genes onto the tray in the middle. Okay? Uh, one of each of your genes. Uh, it's not a good idea to stop at one chromosome. You gotta, you gotta do the whole thing. Okay, now, okay. So, who wins in this first generation? The sexual or the asexual? The asexual, the asexual is ahead two to one, right? This looks, oh man, sex is, is going to quickly run out, run in. Okay, would you uh, disassemble your offspring? We're going to try this again. We've got to see if, we've got to somehow help this crew. Okay, so what, now actually the claim was made that recombination, that, my, that sex creates diversity. What actually creates diversity? What is the source of the raw materials for evolution? It's not just recombination, you have to have another process. Mutation. You've got to have mutation, right? So, now some mutations are beneficial and create interesting diversity. So, for instance, we are going to trade. Uh, would you mind if I? Okay, okay. Um, now, just to keep things fair, we're going, to do, uh, we're going to have some mutations arise that are equally beneficial in creating diversity over here on the. Uh, and let's. Would you like to trade one of those heads of lettuce? Okay, great. And would you like to do the same? Uh, thank you. Okay, so just to show that we're being fair and the, the rates of mutation in these two. Okay, so if we now carried out recombination in, uh, in this group, you could see that these two could put together these interest, an interesting combination. And so, well, maybe we'd, we'd be thinking that the sexual species is starting to catch up, but it turns out that most mutations, most mutations are not beneficial. Most mutations actually diminish gene function. 
or cause genes to work a little less well. They essentially cause genes to rot. So I have to bring the bad news now, which is, uh, well, there's a little bit wilted uh, lettuce, and I'm afraid I'm going to have to, uh, you're going to have to hand over this nice fresh one and replace it with the wilted. And uh, just to be fair about this, we'll do the same over here, uh, if, if you don't mind. Okay, I, I'm sure you're quite happy with this. And then, and then it turns out that this process just continues. Deleterious mutations are far more common. And so, uh, unfortunately, uh, <laughs> Audrey, uh, would you be willing to trade? Okay. And uh, I'm sorry. Uh, <laughs> this is the way it works. Uh, okay. So now, now I'd like to see, looking here over on the, on the clonal species, the clonal species has no choice but to convey this mixed bag. We got some good diversity, but we got some rotted out stuff. And now I would like the sexual species to choose uh, wisely among their genes and create a healthy basket of fruits and vegetables to be passed to the offspring. Excellent, excellent. You really got this down. It only took a couple of generations to figure out how to do this. Good. So the point is that clonal reproducers win in the short term. Okay? If you're starting from a level playing field, the clonal reproducers win in the short term because everybody can have offspring. Mutation provides the raw materials. Some mutations add beneficial diversity, but most mutations actually mildly diminish, gradually cause the genes to rot. And sexual reproducers, um, sexual reproducers have the advantage only in the long run because they get the opportunity over an evolutionary time frame to pass the beneficial mutations together uh, you guys could have put this orange in here. I'm going to help you a little bit more, right? Um, see, you have a really nicely mixed tray there, okay? You get the, you get the opportunity to combine um, the beneficial mutations without the, the drag of the detrimental. And so we see then that meiosis serves as evolution's swap shop, right? We got the swap shop over here. And males essentially provide spare parts for swapping in, OK? Um, and so what I'd like to do is um, I think we should all acknowledge the great contributions of our volunteers. And, <clears throat> um, and you, are, you are free to take back with you any of the fruits and vegetables that you'd like. Uh, now everybody, it looks like everybody's going meiotic right now. Uh, and I also have for you MIT t-shirts. Um, thank, thank you very much. Thank you all. Thank you so much. Okay, great. All right. Now what we're going to do is watch a video that connects two of this morning's themes, meiosis and sex determination. The question is, by what mechanism does an embryo come to carry a Y chromosome or a second X? The answer is found in meiosis, in the father. So in this video of human male meiosis, I want you to look for two things. Guess what they are? Gene swapping, the swapping parts of paired, uh, swapping parts of paired chromosomes, and dividing by two, having the number of chromosomes per cell. So you remember that human cells have 23 pairs of chromosomes, but to illustrate the principles, we're just going to show six pairs here, six pairs of chromosomes, and we're going to look in detail at two pairs. We're going to look at the XY pair here and a pair of autosomes. And you see that we have, um, we have it arranged so that mom's chromosomes, right? You got half your chromosomes from mom, half from dad. We have it arranged so that mom's chromosomes are on the left in red. The chromosomes you got from dad are in blue on the right. <clears throat> and what's the first thing that happens in meiosis? The very first step is you actually don't divide by two. You multiply by two. You double 
all the chromosomes, double all the genes. So at the first step in meiosis is you go to 4N, to a 4N stage. That's where we're beginning. Let's roll the, let's roll the video. OK. So we've got, we're now going to blow up and focus on um, this pair of autosomes on the left. And you see there that recombination can occur at any point along the length of this autosomal pair. Let's see what, re when, what happens when recombination occurs at a particular point. There's the swapping. We've just swapped a bunch of genes. The same can happen on the other arm of that pair of autosomes. Now we're going to turn over to, to the sex chromosomes. That's where the SRY gene is located on the Y. And it turns out that the X and the Y can recombine only within, they normally recombine only within their ends. Let's see how the swap occurs in detail. So we've just swapped parts of uh, some stuff from mom and dad down at the other ends, like so. So at this point, at this point, how many copies of each gene, of each autosomal gene, does this cell have? Four. four. We still have four. We have two copies of the X and two of the Y and four of every autosome. OK. Um, and what we're going to see is, what do we have to do now? We've got to go from four copies down to one per cell. So we're actually going to have two rounds of division. And you're going to see the X up here is going to go to two cells on the top. The Y is going to go to two cells on the bottom. We're going to get four sperm out of this one cell. Let's roll the video. OK, here comes the first division. The cell on the top has two copies of every gene. The cell on the bottom, two. Now comes the second division. Remember, we've got the X's in the two cells on the top, the Y's on the two cells on the bottom. And these are going to go on to mature into sperm. So we will now have X-bearing sperm on the top and Y-bearing sperm on the bottom. And now these sperm have to go in search of eggs. Uh, let's roll the video. Now they'll, uh, they're, they're fired up. Uh, on the experiment, the experiment on the top, uh, the X-bearing sperm in purple are going to win down uh, uh, below the Y-bearing sperm. We end up with an XX fertilized egg, an XY fertilized egg. And then, as we said, the first six weeks of human development are anatomically, histologically indistinguishable in male and female. We progress up to the seven-week stage right here. And it's only at this point that the SRY gene fires and leads to the birth of a male or female. OK, so how do XX males carrying SRY arise? How do XY females deleted for SRY arise? I want you to remember that the XX males are carrying a terminal portion of the Y chromosome. The XY females are missing a terminal portion of the Y chromosome. We're going to see how that happens in a rerun of a part of this video we just watched. Let's run that video now. OK. So here again, we got the six chromosomes that are representing our 23 pairs. Now we're going to look just at the XY pair. And we're going to watch an aberrant recombination or gene swapping. So there again is the SRY gene on the Y chromosome. Recombination would normally be restricted out at the very ends of the X and the Y. But occasionally, an aberrantly placed recombination event. Look, that one is too far down. And look what's happening. The SRY gene is being passed over to an X chromosome. And look, here's a Y chromosome that has lost SRY as a result of this misplaced swapping event. So we end up with an X chromosome that is SRY plus and a Y chromosome that is SRY minus. That's exactly how XX males and XY females in humans are generated. I want to stop there and take some questions again. A question from the house on any topic we've discussed so far. Yes? You said that uh, what if a bad gene goes in? Wouldn't the clone be better? Oh, you're saying if a, the question is if, if a mutation arises that causes a gene to be a bit rotted, wouldn't the clone be better off? If they had all good genes. If they had all good, ah, you're thinking about recessive and, and such. 
So, of course, we do have two copies, of, we do have two copies of, of all our genes, and so you'd say, well, maybe we can take one hit. Well, there are two ways, there are two ways that this might be dangerous. You're well set up now. What happens if you get a second hit in that same gene? You don't have any way to clean house, right? Meiosis provides you an opportunity to swap out for, some, for somebody else's clean copy. The other thing is that sometimes there are diseases that result from having just one defective gene copy, right? We can have dominant diseases or diseases where gene dosage is really critically sensitive. You're going to hear much more about the importance of gene dosage in lecture two from Barbara Meyer. Uh, how about a question from our, our uh, audience in Moscow? Well, my question is that how do lizards multiply by pathogenesis or by the same technology as uh, uh, Dolly the sheep. Right. So the, the, the question is whether um, lizards have mastered the, uh, the art of, of uh, cloning by the methods produced, uh, used to produce Dolly. Well, the lizards pull it off naturally. They don't have the benefit of a laboratory. And again, as I mentioned, it's by parthenogenesis, but we really don't understand how it works. So uh, cloning in lizards remains a mystery. I must admit that the, even the practice of cloning in, um, uh, in mammals is, uh, is, is very much uh, uh, an art as it is a science at this point. I want to just thank uh, all of our audience at a distance in Moscow and, and the audience here in the, in the room for great questions. And I want to thank you and say goodbye at this time. Thank you, David, for a scintillating lecture. Now we're going to break for a half hour, after which Barbara Meyer will tell us about sex determination in a very different experimental organism the nematode worm, Cenorhabditis elegans. Like mammals, C. elegans has two sexes, but in this case, instead of male and female, they're male and hermaphrodites. I'm sure you, you'll want to return in 30 minutes for the details.